Finish. Sorry about that. Hello, Kai. We're finally here. Yes. Brilliant. So, uh, would you like to crack on and hash out some of the diamond model that we've been working on since the conference? Yes, let's do that. So, um, if you bring up the screen of the diamond model, then let's um, go through each component no. briefly and make sure that it all holds together. Okay. Great. So do you want to like just give a quick two minute intro to what it is you're doing here? Yes. And why we're doing this? Uh, no problem. I've been working on my master by research in art and design, which is geared in visual modeling. And I've decided to focus on STEM topics, namely the physics of consciousness and trying to visually communicate a visual model of consciousness. Part of that process was to create what is the theory of relative consciousness and all of the visuals that have come from the research and the mechanics and the theoretical framework is all visual modeling, you know? So it all, collects together as a framework of theory to communicate this idea that I've come or deduced from what I've been reading through my literature review as part of my research. So the theory of relative consciousness is a number of different visuals. There's a mechanics section, there's a Venn diagram, there's a number of different visual kinetics for explaining the idea through terms of physics for people to understand the idea and how it applies. And I was lucky enough to meet you at the conference and after your amazing talk on the diamond model, I found some coherences in my mind with what you were communicating as a system of um, it's, it's basically a system of cosmology. Mm -hmm. And I realized that my idea might apply to this. And I was lucky enough to have you sit with me and we were able to hash out a basic idea of what is on the screen now within an hour. It was quite uh, enlightening. Yes. So we've arrived now after a number of intellectual and creative interfaces and few chats and this is the digitized version of what we created that night with a little bit more complexity, but it, it's um, showing some brilliant potential as part of my research now. And my lecturer said that, well, my the supervisor for my research has said that um, this is the outcome for my research now, because uh -huh. this encompasses everything in the other models together in a way where I can explain the emergence of this kind of cosmology and where the idea would fit and where the cultural kinetics can be compared to others and other civilizations or other ways of living, other cosmologies. And yeah, um, that's basically how we've come to this diamond model of relative consciousness as part of my research. So I want to thank you for that again. Um, I'd like everyone to know that I'm going to be eternally grateful for this contribution for my work. And um, I'm very much looking forward to now hashing out these ideas and making sure that we've got it on record with us logically going through these pieces and making sure that it does actually stand up. Great, yes. Okay, so why don't we, um, if we start with multiplicity, that's the, the level I usually start with when I'm introducing the diamond model to people, Brilliant. because that's, that's the level that most people live at and can understand most easily. Okay. So let's start with that and look at some of these correspondences that we've found. So we've got the Newtonian relativity and special relativity um, paradigms there yes um 
So I would say the Newtonian works most obviously well, because the Newtonian worldview is that the world is made up of separate parts, okay. um, which relate to each other through relatively constant laws, the laws of motion, laws of gravity, um, the, 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 the laws of light, the way that light works. Okay. Um, so we have a three-dimensional world that's working in a relatively mechanistic way um, where everything is pretty much predictable what's going to happen. So I think the Newtonian world matches onto multiplicity very well there. I should actually go back. I didn't properly say what multiplicity is. Multiplicity basically is the three-dimensional world of space-time made up of separate parts of separate things, separate events, which interact with each other purely at that level of parts. So yeah, as I've just explained, the Newtonian paradigm actually fits that extremely well. Um, so I mean, I'll stop there. Does anything to add to that? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, definitely. Um, because of uh, the, the Newtonian way of thinking, um, is, and the way of obviously uh, mathematics then, uh, applied mathematics. Mm. Um, this is what then obviously gives me the idea that relativity and special relativity are also part of that Newtonian understanding for us now. Mm. In, in yeah. contemporary culture, we would be speaking about relativity rather than Newtonian, wouldn't we? I think. Yes, would, in, would, would you agree with that? Yeah, in in some cases, yes. I mean, I think what 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 happened with Einstein is that the Newtonian model still works very well much of the time, okay. but there are going to be certain cases where it starts to break down. So, for example, um, the relationship between um, two objects in motion relative to one another, or what happens to an object as it becomes goes faster and faster and approaches the speed of light. Um, what happens to time when it, it, it what, what, how is time relative between say someone standing still and someone in, in motion relative to that person who's standing still. When it, these kind of considerations, the Newtonian worldview started to break down or not be applicable exactly okay. so i think that led to relativity and special relativity and um i would say they still belong to the realm of multiplicity because you're still at the realm of parts okay. um the and relationships the great, between those parts isn't it exactly yes yeah uh, but i mean the great contribution is that the great difference rather is that einstein <clears throat> Einstein added the fourth dimension of time. So time, obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So whereas Newton was was thinking in terms of three dimensions, relativity theory now adds a dimension of time. But time is still linear time, certainly, is still within the realm of multiplicity. Instead of having separate objects, you've got separate moments. But moments in time are still parts, in the same yes, way that yeah. objects in space are still parts. So you're still still at the realm of multiplicity. It's relativity and special relativity is just a more refined and advanced uh, way of dealing with multiplicity because you're taking into consideration time. Uh, I mean, New Newton believed that time was just a constant, so okay. it didn't really have to be a dimension. But in a, in a sense, Einstein found that time was, uh, in some sense, flexible. Okay. Um, and that, that's what led to that relativity theory, but it's still multiplicity in that sense. Yeah. So you're okay. dealing with macro events. You're not dealing with, uh, you, you know, you're dealing with events happening at the, the level of the atom or, or bigger, um, where uh, you're not dealing with, with, with what later on we'll see are micro events, which are subatomic events. Okay. Um, and these macro events, space and time effectively happen relative <laughs> to one another. So you've got the, the, these macro relativistic events. And um, if these laws of motion or, or Newton's laws or, or even Einstein's laws effectively are correct, which they've pretty much been proven to be at the macro level, then at that level, you've, you've got what we can call an adequate determinism there. 
uh, in that events at that level are pretty much determined. If we had enough information, we would know what's going to happen beforehand at that level. Um, and this is what Bohm referred to as the explicate order, which again is the order that is accessible to our senses. So this is the order of the reality that we can pick up with our five senses and analyze using the powers of human reason. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's effectively how Bohm would have defined the explicate order. So all of that comes nicely in this general category of multiplicity. Brilliant. It's great to see how those things stack up, really, uh. as a concept, isn't it, of multiplicity, really, as in itself. Like, it's really quite shocking. So, which part would you explain next after multiplicity? Okay. Logically, um, logically. logically I, would, I would normally explain the whole next. Okay. So, because what I, would, what I would say is that this relative world of multiplicity is not everything. There is a deeper realm which is a more holistic realm where things are connected in a way they're not at the level of multiplicity. Yes. And in some sense, multiplicity is a manifestation or an emergence from out of that underlying whole. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. So this application of the whole and nonlinear time and quantum mechanics and part of the implicate order, as Bohm would explain it. Uh, uh. Do, you, do you think that that applies to well, your understandings of the whole as you've applied it to the other models and the other cultures through the book? Well, the unity of everything? Uh, mm. I mean, I think it does reasonably well, yes. I mean, I think um, time um, at the level of multiplicity is putting it very crudely it's the time it takes to get from one object to another or the time it takes to get from one moment to another Definitely, and the yes. best it's way the rate we've... of change isn't it it's... yeah it's... exactly yeah. yeah it's the rate of change at at the at a level of separate objects and, and of separate separate objects and separate events yes. and linear time is the the best way that we've found or the best way that has manifested to For be us, able um, to with, with our identities, obviously, and our personal exactly, yeah. and our personal systems and our obviously societal systems. That's the best way we've found for our consciousness to move forward is linear time, isn't it? So in comparison yeah, exactly. to that, that's the best way we've found. And, and in comparison to that, with the whole, yeah, how does non-linear time then apply? Um, I think that there's two ways of looking at this. I mean, in, in a sense, when we are truly deep, deep in the hole, if you like, yeah. there's no time at all because time actually emerges out of the hole in any form at all. Um, but when we're using the word the whole, I think we have to be a little bit generous with our use of that term. Okay. Um, it's it's kind it, it would encompass, if you like, the void yes, out of okay. which everything comes and back into which everything goes. Okay. What in Bud in Buddhism we call that emptiness. Uh, speaking like sort of metaphorically, that's that's the state that there was before the Big Bang. There, there was this kind of nothingness. Okay. out of which everything comes and back into which everything goes. But we can also use the word the whole to mean, if you like, the, the initial singularity out of which everything emerged and back into which everything goes. So that's not quite the whole. That's, if you like, that first, um, that first condensed point out of which everything emerges and back into which everything goes. Brilliant. Does this does this distinction make sense? The void. It does, the yes, yeah, definitely, yeah. So, so I would say if we're talking about the void, then it would probably be more accurate to say there's no time at all at that level. Okay. 
but if we're talking about the singularity, um, then I think time has to be clearly implicit in that, because time is going to is something has to be there in that singularity out of which time can emerge. Okay. So that, that that basic ground ground of time has to be there. Um, and I think at that level, because we don't yet have separate things and separate events, it would be nonlinear time. It would be it would be nonlinear time because linearity. We don't have the the network, the background network, necessary on which to impose linearity. Brilliant. So it has to be just that underlying potential for linear time, which okay. which we have to just call in very general terms at this point nonlinear. Okay, so for these micro events and mm -hmm. this non-linear time and this part of the whole, do you, do you agree with me with the application of micro events and quantum mechanics at this level? Because um, as far as I see it, if we're talking about the Big Bang also, we're, gonna, we're talking about the standard model and we're talking about atoms, bosons, particle mm -hmm. physics. This is mm -hmm. high intellect physics is particle physics mm -hmm. it's obviously nothing that i can express mathematically myself but mm -hmm. i can grasp this idea and i do think that this applies you know mm -hmm. so would you agree with that application that of the micro events for human experience being within the realm of quantum mechanics and a part of the whole yeah i think we can we can talk in those terms yeah I think, again, if we divide the whole into um, void and singularity, just, just to be really precise about this, okay. um, I think, again, at the level of the void, there's no, there are no particles. There's, no, there's nothing at that level. But as soon as you're moving into, uh, as soon as you've, you've got the singularity, in, I mean, I'll just, as an aside, I'll just say that Wilbur, Ken Wilbur refers to these realms as, he refers to the realm of the whole as the causal, the causal realm because it's, it's the ultimate cause of everything. But he distinguishes between what he calls the high causal and the low causal. Oh, yeah. So the high causal is what I'm calling the void. That's emptiness, that's, there's nothing there. Um, and he refers to the low causal, he uses the term low causal to refer to that initial singularity, that initial point. In Eastern philosophy, that's called the Bindu. It's okay. that initial point out of which everything comes. I think at that level, then yes, we it, we have to start talking in terms of if we're going to talk about it at all, then yes, I think micro events and quantum mechanics is going to be the closest that we can get to that singularity, because the micro events and the subatomic particles are going to be the initial, the, the very first thing that emerges out of yes, the void. Yes, yeah, it's the it's the foundation, isn't it? It's the building blocks exactly. for everything that comes out of multiplicity as exactly as um interface well as a factor of existence basically isn't it well, for us as observers then so exactly yeah. so so uh, in that sense the the micro events and the subatomic particles that are being described using quantum mechanics are the most fundamental level of existence and so they're, they're either they're there, at, we can either say they're there at the whole, or they are the very first minuscule manifestation that arises out of the whole. Okay. Depending on whether we're talking about void or singularity. So generally speaking, yes, we can de we definitely put that in that general whole realm in the, in the more general way we're using that term. Yeah, I think so. Yes, okay. and and there'll be an a, an additional argument for this when we come to look at the mechanics between the observer and the observed. But for now, before we come to that, we can just say that's the most fundamental realm at which the universe operates. Brilliant. So, <clears throat> would you agree that at this level, bombs? explanation for implicate order would apply. I know you have a better understanding of Bohm's uh, theories with this. So um, yeah, the I, idea I of implicate so, yes. order and coherence on the level of the whole, does that, does that stand up with the idea of what we've already explained of nonlinear time? 
Yes, I think so. Um, if, the, if we talk about the implicate order again as being that hidden dimension out of which everything emerges and back into which everything goes, then quantum mechanics, because you're dealing with the most basic subatomic particles, is going to be the best language that we currently have to get as close to that implicate order as we possibly can in, in the realm of physics, yeah. And coherence, yes, in the sense that the, the whole of the manifest universe exists in its potential state at the level of the whole. And if, if a universe that operates according to mathematical laws is going to emerge at all, then we must have that initial condition of coherence for that to even happen. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. I understand that now completely. I knew it, uh, it, was, it had some relevance and I put it in there with coherence, but thank you for explaining that. That was very insightful. So now we understand the ideas of multiplicity and the ideas of how we've applied the whole and we know that multiplicity comes from the whole through this process of emergence. We have to talk now about this interface between what is the observer and the implications mm -hmm. of the observer and what is observed. And obviously then what I've applied as the interface between that relationship, or the interface and relationship between observer and observed. Right. So, so yeah, after you, after after you. you please. So, so my, um, when I originally formulated this model, my, my thesis was that my question was, how does the whole become the part? How, how does wholeness manifest as multiplicity? Is there an intermediate level between the whole and the part? And I was um, inspired really by the Eastern traditions at this point because the Eastern traditions talk about the whole as being what they call the causal level and multiplicity as being the gross level, but there's an intermediate level that they refer to as the subtle level. Uh, and that subtle level is the interface. I'm looking vertically now. It's the vertical interface between the whole and multiplicity. Okay, yeah. And according to the Eastern traditions, it's at that subtle level that an archetypal sense of self that sees itself as separate from an archetypal sense of not self or object starts to emerge. Okay. Or to put it another way, we start to get the differentiation in a very subtle, uh, implicit form between mind and matter at this subtle at this subtle level um also i was inspired by the poetry you get in uh, the chinese tradition of taoism okay. um which, which i mentioned in my talk at skipton uh which is which which talks about how the one becomes the two and the two becomes the three and the three becomes the many so if if the multiplicity if the realm of multiplicity is you know either the three or the many there has to be this intermediate place where there's a two in between the one and the many and that two, which they call the yin and the yang, I think in a more general sense has to be that, that very first multiplicity that we make in our in our day to day life, or the very first multiplicity that occurs in consciousness. The first division, the primary dualism is that between the observer and the observed. Brilliant, yeah. If we didn't make that distinction, then talking about multiplicity wouldn't make any sense because there'd be nobody there to observe the multiplicity. You have to separate out the self first before you can even talk in terms of separate parts, because there has to be somebody who's observing those separate parts. Um, so that's why the whole I'm suggesting we have this initial differentiation between the observer and the observed. And then that differentiation, if you like, um, trying to think of the right word, extrapolates to generate this world of multiplicity. Yep. 
Um, so if we look at those in turn, the observer, I think that's quite straightforward. That's the sense of self, that's the subject, that's the mind. Yeah. And the observed, that's the, the object, that's the, 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 the world of matter. That's something that we can be aware of. Yes. Um, and you're including in there, can you explain a little bit about what you mean there by sense of awareness and visual memory? In terms of relative consciousness, uh -huh. um, relative consciousness is a visual model of consciousness as attention to memory. Okay, it's a higher uh -huh. order th theory of consciousness as attention to memory. So, but it's a visual model. So, part of the mechanics and part of the understanding is that data points exist based on your sensory awareness. Data points in your own personal timeline through whatever space you travel through as an observer, they are based on your sense of awareness and what what it focused on mostly with the sense of awareness is visual memory and visual memory is based on what you see in the environment and it's visible because of your exposure to the photons in the environment and it's because of those photons that reality is able to manifest uh -huh. and i think that applies to matter more than it would I think it applies to matter and object because it, that's it, in the environment. It's, it's around us. It's the okay. sense of visual memory is it's, it's it's obviously circumstantial to the observer, isn't it? Where wherever you are, there's so many variables for what you could observe, and there's so many variables for who could observe it. As we said, without the observer and the observed, we, we don't even get to multiplicity. So I think the sense of visual memory and sense of awareness applies to the observed that rather than right. the observer. Right. Because it's obviously yep. Yep. exterior of the observer. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So we really are using the word observer <coughs> in a very rigorous sense, just to mean consciousness. Yes. Anything that anything that can arise as an object within consciousness, even if it's necessary for awareness to happen, if it's an object in consciousness, it's part of the observed, not part of the observer. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay yep. Yeah, that 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 makes sense to me. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. So when it comes to relative consciousness, mm. and I, I see it applying as the interface here between object and subject, and we came to this agreement when we first uh, explained the idea. Not all of mm. uh, the people who may view this uh, will know what we've explained, but the, it's, it's a visual model of the conscious experience of the observer. So it applies to human experience, okay? so. We came to this understanding, and this is how the diamond model has arisen. And do you find it? Do you find that uh, these four quadrants that arose from the basic layout of this diamond to be as um, it's like serendipity? It's, it's, it, it almost illustrated the need to apply these sections of qualitative cyclical, mm -hmm. qualitative, quantitative cyclical, qualitative mm -hmm. physical, quantitative physical, and how these applied then to his four quadrants of I, it, we, and its. It was absolutely phenomenal when you told me that these things apply. And after yeah. researching to those things that were explained by Wilbur and more into integral theory, it, it, integral the integral theory and these four quadrants are really explaining the facets of human experience. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Exactly. So yes. do you do you agree with where they are placed on the diamond model as they are? And can you explain a little bit how you see these applying 
because I'd like to hear, hear your take on that and I'd like to have that as a reference point to come back to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so once we now that we've established, if you like, the four corners of the diamond. Yes, yeah. Speaking that way, um, we've actually got two pairs of um, dualities at work here. We've got the whole and the part, yes. which are which are parts of a duality, the whole part duality. Yes, yeah. And and. Um, would you agree that that just exists within our consciousness, though, that duality as observers? Would you say that the, yes. our consciousness facilitates that duality? Yes, because mm. I would say that consciousness is capable of two... Uh, consciousness can operate in two different modes. Okay. There's the mode of... Um, if you like silence, where there is a simple observation without um, any kind of thinking or feeling or cognizing or conceptualization. Uh, if you like, that's the level of um, what mystics and mystics would refer to as in the intuitive mind, the, in, in, the, the level of the level of non-conceptual or transconceptual intuition. Okay. That's one mode in which consciousness can operate. And the other mode in which consciousness can operate is the um, conceptual mind, where we, where we think and categorize and um, create abstractions and, 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 and draw inferences and so on. Now, I think these two aspects of consciousness, we could call those the passive and the active, if you like. Okay. Passive consciousness and active consciousness uh, mirror exactly with the whole and the part, I think. Yeah. So the, 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 the level of the whole is the passive consciousness. We could even call that the absolute consciousness. Okay. And the, the level of multiplicity is the um, passive, uh, sorry, is the active consciousness, which is um, where thought comes in and starts breaking up what is being, what is arising in consciousness passively. Yeah. It starts breaking it up into parts. So the whole and the part exist in consciousness as passive and active passive and active modes brilliant so i need to i, I definitely need to uh, label passive and active consciousness yeah. as on the on the diagram yeah yes yeah, we can do that brilliant, so, brilliant application yeah thank yeah. you for so that. the whole could be uh, the passive the passive consciousness and multiplicity is the um, active consciousness uh, yeah. and we could even we could even say to we've got relative consciousness there in the middle the whole could also be um absolute consciousness Brilliant. That's, that's phenomenal. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Okay. Okay. That's brilliant. Yep. Brilliant. Yeah. So that's our first dualism there of the diamond between the whole and multiplicity. And perpendicular to that, we've got our second dualism, which is the observer and the observed. Yes. Yeah. That's self and other. And these two dualisms actually interact with each other in all four permutations to create these four essential realms of experience that match very closely with, if not exactly, with uh, Ken Wilber's four quadrants, which he's arrived at in a slightly different way. Okay. Uh, in, fact, in fact, one of the things, and this is a bit, this is a bit bold, I'm going to say something a bit bold now, a bit courageous. Okay. okay. But, <laughs> But uh, one of the things in integral theory is that why exactly those four quadrants are the way they are is not really explained. It, it, it just, it's just said that, well, every, every holon has an inside and an outside and can occur um, in the singular and the plural. And you then mix them all together and you get this, these four quadrants. But there isn't a, as far as I'm aware, that there isn't a deeper metaphysical reason why the quadrants emerge in this particular way so coherently. My suggestion is the diamond gives that explanation. Because really? the structure. Okay. Yeah, that's what okay, I'm yeah. that's what I'm suggesting. Like I said, it's a bit it's a bit bold. But what I'm suggesting here is that the the, the diamond here is every holon the structure of any holon is is this diamond this diamond is the structure of any holon so any holon has to have a hole and a part 
and an observer and an observed by the very nature of reality. Yes. Yeah. So these four, these four, um, I don't want to call them quadrants. I'm trying to think of a, another word for them. But these, these four realms, if you like, these four realms of experience. Um, yeah. We could even call them these four archetypes. That would also work. Yes. Yeah. That these, would be that would be good. Yeah. So these four archetypes emerge of necessity as a result of the structure of the holon. It has to be that way. Yeah. Um, okay. So so when we so let's look at each of these four combinations. So when the whole. Can you see that clearly enough on the screen there, Nish? Oh yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah. Okay, can you? Yeah. yeah, I can. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So let's look at these four combinations. So okay. when we have the whole interacting with the observer, what we really mean there is that aspect of the sense of self that is unified. Yes. And with that the one. that is the uh, yeah the one the one as applied to one's sense of self. That's right. Which is which is obviously what we call the I, the first person pronoun, yes, is yes. the whole of the observer. So let, let's just go through them in this way first. So you've got, you've got the I, yeah. which is the whole of the observer. Yeah, that's uh, all, you, you, we would say that's subjective, yes? Yes, that, that's the subjective aspect of your experience because that's what you experience as a unified sense of self which is yeah, the subject yeah. yeah uh if we now look at the the multiple sense of self that has to be when we are interacting with others yes because those are also lots of separate selves and when we're interacting with other selves like me and you are doing now there's two selves that are interacting we're yeah. creating a we space which is dialogue. obviously uh, part of the interface between that multiplicity as observer to observer. Exactly, exactly. It's the it's the multi it's it's the observer. It's, it's the aspect. Yeah, it's the aspect of the observer that is uh, multiple rather than unified. Intersubjective. Yeah, which is the intersubjective aspect of experience, which we could also call the cultural aspect of experience. So culture, yeah. what we call culture is the interface or the interplay rather between multiplicity and the observer. Brilliant. Uh, so we'll come back to the quality and quantity in a minute. Brilliant. Uh, uh, now, if we look at the whole applied to the observed. It's obviously it. it really it's obviously is. it, yeah. Yes, yeah. That's where yeah, that, yeah. Because now we're looking at the observed, what's arising in consciousness, what's being seen observed. by observed by that self but looked at as as a whole looked at as one as a singular yeah. so that is the it which is the objective okay. and then we have when the observed there's an interplay between the observed and multiplicity then we have the interaction between lots of separate its interacting with each other and that's the interobjective which we could also call the social okay so we have the subjective, the objective, the cultural, and the social. And these four archetypes have to be in place before we go full blown into multiplicity, because those four archetypes will structure our experience of multiplicity. So they are integral to this system of yep. the interface. Yep between and they are in the whole yeah. system really isn't it it's, it's the it's can you explain in it okay. in any way um about ken wilbur and what he did with the tango theory just for the benefit of the video please so what what ken wilbur did until about 1995 from 1970 to 1995 for 25 years wilbur wilbur's models were essentially about levels levels of consciousness or levels of development that were just and human experience basically isn't it pardon and, and human experience isn't it, it was, uh, uh, yeah 
but so these are the these are the different levels of experience, the different levels of consciousness. But yeah. it was just a one dimensional diagram, effectively. Yes. So you had, say, for example, you know, matter, then emotions, then mind, then soul, then spirit. But what Wilbur said happened is when he was writing his book, Sex, Ecology, Spirituality, which is kind of his magnum opus, he um, had all these piles of post-it notes all over the floor um, where he was listing hundreds of different types of hierarchies. Okay. And he just found that they tended to fall into four different categories. And he had this flash of insight that these four different categories were actually um, hierarchies of the self, hierarchies of culture, hierarchies of um, the, the, uh, the objective world, of nature, if you like, and hierarchies of society, of social. And it's through looking, it's through seeing these four different types of hierarchy quite arbitrarily that he came upon these four quadrants. Okay. Um, this is really, I, I find that really, really quite a trigger in because the way that that has come about to be applied to this now, and it's another person's work who, who's applied to something that I'm doing, you know, I, I find that really significant and your explanations for how they arise as part of this interview to really be quite mind blowing. It blows my mind. Mm. It is, it is fascinating how, um, because it took me a long time. I mean, I had this diamond model for a long time before I saw these four, um, these four quadrants emerging in this um, diamond model. Because I think you saw the talk I gave with um, Marilyn and Peter on this, the yes. World Unity Week. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that was only about six months ago. So it's quite recent that I saw this, um, the way the four quadrants naturally emerge as necessary parts of the diamond so this isn't just something that we that you've applied to, to this model of the diamond consciousness you've seen these four quadrants apply into your own workings with the diamond model and applying it to other obviously other cultures and other civilizations through history yes i mean i i mean i haven't what i, I haven't just tried to make wilbur's work sort of arbitrarily fit into this no i, I can see it's if, more like a key code if this fits in yeah, like yeah. a key and a lock more than mm. uh, a hammer and a nail you know it's yeah i mean i think even if wilbur's work had never been had never happened i think these four quadrants would have arisen would still anyway. have quite naturally emerged from exactly would have yeah. arisen from by necessity from this these these diamonds in, in other words it's not contrived i think this this is naturally emerging. These are the four, I mean, speaking poetically, these are the four shades of the diamond. Diamonds of different shades. These are the four shades of the diamond. Okay. Uh, and these are the four fundamental archetypes that feed into our experience of the world. They must do, because okay. they, they, they are the interplay of everything that makes up the world. Okay, it's interesting that you've, you've used that word shades. Okay, I understand that. I fully hear what you're explaining. And I just want to focus a little bit on what you said about the four shades of the diamond, okay? Because yeah. just, just for a second. So yeah. the four shades of the diamond, do you think we could explain those with different colours? Well, yes, uh, uh, because I think they correlate very well to spiral dynamics. Uh, are you, I mean, uh, are you familiar with spiral I, dynamics? Familiar like, from... When you attended my talk on Saturday, Yes, I, I am familiar with uh, the spiral dynamics as it was explained in the conference and from your talk on Saturday. I find it really fascinating. Yeah. So, which um, I know I so, can't so, yeah. say that certain colors apply to. Uh, can you explain I, how you would apply it? How would you apply yes, it? Yes, so I, I sure. So, so, I would say that if we focus on four levels in spiral dynamics, which are signified by the colors red, blue, orange, and green. So very basically red is the level where we first develop an ego for the yeah. first time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Red is the level historically uh, where the ego emerges as a separate self and the person 
differentiates himself from his tribal consciousness, which was at purple, which is the Ooh. level before. We would say that so red, red is so eye. red. Exactly. So I would say at red, your primary uh, mode of awareness is first person awareness. Okay. So at that level, I would say that I is is red in that sense. Yes. Okay. So the we would be blue, would it? The we would be blue because what happens at we, at blue is that we no longer identify with the separate self. We now identify with the group or the tradition. Or, or the group of people that we identify with. So I could say I'm a Christian or I'm a Hindu or I'm an Indian or I'm Spanish. That's that's blue we thinking, second person. Yeah. So the we would be blue. Okay. Then the next level is orange. Now orange is where you take a third person perspective yeah. and you, for the first time, uh, starting in ancient Greece and particularly with the Renaissance 500 years ago in Europe, okay. you're able to look at things objectively empirically rationally and use the scientific method to discover objective truths so that's it. the world of the it so yeah. it would be orange mm. and then the, the green is the level of a uh, pluralism so that's the level of postmodernism, where you understand that things are connected things work as processes things work as systems so instead of just isolated lots of uh, uh, instead of thinking in terms of lots of isolated third person it's yeah you've now got a fourth person it's process so i would say that it's fourth person that would be green so the shades of the diamond would be uh top left red bottom left blue top right orange bottom right green uh, and that would also bring in uh the spiral dynamics uh code into the way we're looking at this brilliant it's very interesting because uh, the my super research supervisor asked me to consider applying different colours and things and to logically apply those colours in uh, reference to another visual model. It would be very interesting for my writing and uh, I think it's going to spur on some more developments for this model now. That's yeah, so. yeah. So we've actually managed to. Um tie in um, with uh, the spiral dynamics model here as well. In that brilliant, sense. yeah, brilliant, it's fascinating. So um, what we can say about fragmentation, because we've spoken about how the whole arises out of the ground state, we know that we are talking about human experience as um, every passing moment as a relationship between emergence and dissolution. And these are the systems that hold up human conscious experience. So we have to then explain fragmentation. So can we yeah. just briefly have a discussion about that? And sure. I think, before, uh, before, I, before I do that, can, can I briefly just look at, because we didn't explain the quality and quantity aspect of the indeed, four quadrants. Indeed. My apologies. Yeah, no problem. So um, now that we've got a good grasp, I think, of what we mean by I, we, it and it's, yes, yeah. I think it's pretty obvious why the left hand quadrants are psychical and the right hand quadrants are physical, because yeah, it makes complete sense. That makes complete. Oh, that's obvious. Yeah, because yes, yeah, yeah. you're looking at the inner, the inner aspect is psychical. Yes. and the outer aspect is physical yeah. what i think we have to talk about now is that why is the why are the higher quadrants quality and why are the lower quadrants quantity again i think the quantity is is relatively obvious because we're talking the about the realm of multiplicity multiplicity we're exactly counting things quantities exactly exactly quantifications so so that's why the lower quadrants are quantity yeah. Now, the higher quadrants, I would say, are quality because the, the, quant the quantitative exist in the higher quadrants. In As you move towards the whole, things are going back into their seed form. So in, at, at the level of the seed, before the seed has become the plant, if you like, to use yes, that metaphor, yeah. The seed, before it emerges, before it emerges, 
it's not nothing. It still contains within it the, all the qualities. Potential, obviously, isn't it? The potential of the plant in, yes, in, yeah. in terms of its potential qualities. Those qualities, I mean, think of the genetic code, for example. The genetic code already contains what you are in terms of the qualities. Yes, obviously, there's 23 chromosomes from each yeah, parent. Exactly. Isn't it? Yeah. So that's why I think if you're dealing with the, the upper quadrants, which are to do with the whole rather than multiplicity, you're talking more at the level of the potential seed, which contains the qualities of what will later through emergence show up as the quantities. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So that's you've got, phenomenal that's how that applies. It's really phenomenal. Really it's all, really it, it all fits really beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that's why I think we've got our qualitative and quantitative, psychical and physical there. Brilliant, yeah. Thank you, Mish. Um, so, we, it's, can we talk about fragmentation? Yep. Just yep. Brief, briefly, um, how do you see uh, incoherence first applying? Because uh, that's obviously um, in complete uh opposite to this coherence that we have at the whole so can we just explain the coherence first and then yes, yes. we can get into those other aspects so let me explain fragmentation in in the abstract first so and and uh, fragmentation is the part of this model that has i think perhaps when i've talked to people like peter mary and marilyn hamilton um on this it's the part that they consider to be the in some way the most radically new information that they've come across um because it's not spoken of very clearly in in other models i don't think okay. um so fragmentation basically means that this multiplicity this realm of multiplicity that emerges out of the whole, it has its own relative autonomy. It's not a, at the level of multiplicity itself, there is an adequate determinism. Yes, yeah. But if you look at multiplicity in relation to the, so, so put it another way, horizontally, multiplicity has an adequate determinism. Yes, yeah. But, but vertically in relation to the whole, uh, it's, it's not determined. It's unpredictable, exactly. Yes, exactly. yeah. So yeah. So yeah. that's why vertically, if it's unpredictable vertically, that the multiplicity in relation to the whole is unpredictable vertically, then the potential must exist for multiplicity to behave in a way that makes it incoherent with the whole. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 It has to have that. Uh, if, if that possibility just isn't there, then you've got a, a total thoroughgoing determinism, which I don't think we have. So therefore, the possibility for what we could call disorder, multiplicity running away with itself and doing things that it shouldn't be doing, put it that way, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, 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 that possibility has to exist if we, given that there isn't a vertical determinism. And when that potential for disorder is actualized, as it is in human consciousness, certainly, yeah. then you, you've moved away from the coherence of the whole into a realm of incoherence. And one of the ways that manifests is human suffering. When human beings suffer, it's because their consciousness has moved away from multiplicity to fragmentation. That makes complete sense. Okay, so... So let me give you an, let me give you an example of that in human consciousness, just to really thrash it out. Let's look at the human race. Yeah. Now, at the level of the whole, we're all just one human species. At yeah. the level of the at the level of multiplicity, we can, for convenience, divide the human race up into different Cartier, races yeah. culturally. Yeah, yeah. culturally. Absolutely. But when when that division into races runs away with itself and loses touch with that underlying wholeness of humanity you can get racism and division between races which then falls into a fragmentation and then ra racism causes incoherence yes yeah and there are similar examples in you know in in all kind political uh in politics in religion there's all kinds of examples we can give up 
Okay. That makes complete sense. Makes complete sense. Um, so, just before we go into the illusion of free will, to obviously end off what we're uh, explaining about fragmentation, I've applied fallacy as part of fragmentation. And I believe that applies because if we go away from the logical order and through the multiplicity, we don't apply a logical order or have a logical order. I do believe that natural human experience arrives at fallacy through mm -hmm. fragmentation. Do you think that applies? Yeah, oh, completely, yeah. Because if multiplicity, going back to Newtonian physics, multiplicity is the realm where you have all these laws operating, which can be described mathematically. Yeah. Okay. Or more generally, you have the uh, Aristotelian logic, Aristotle, who laid down the basic laws of logic um, that applies at the realm of multiplicity. So, for example, um, if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C. Yeah, that's the basic yeah. law of logic yeah. that, that, apply, that applies at the level of multiplicity. Um, but when we fail to think or behave or speak or operate a, according to those underlying laws of logic, then basically we have moved into the realm of fragmentation in the, in the sense of committing logical and rational fallacies. Okay, thank you. So a, fall a fallacy is a fragmentation in relation to the logic and the reason of multiplicity. Brilliant, yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so we both agreed that we could apply the illusion of free will in fragmentation, especially when we've spoken about the human experience in terms of determinism out of Newtonian aspects of multiplicity. And um, we're talking about this explicit order. And I see in the free will or the illusion of free will as part of this fragmentation because we've we're lost our uh, if we have this illusion then we're not really in connection with the whole and multiplicity as a f system i don't i don't see the system standing up without determinism and i feel w the free will and the illusion of free will would be a fragmentation of multiplicity. Do you think that applies? Can you explain anything to how that would apply in, from your perspective? Yeah, I think so. Because again, if multiplicity is at multiplicity, we have to be in some sense plugged into the whole. Multiplicity doesn't lose its sense of connection with the whole. Okay. So at the level, if we are operating at the level of multiplicity, which is um, where we are operating in harmony with the whole, then we're not going to lose touch with or move away from that adequate determinism that we, that we see at the level of multiplicity. Okay. Does that make sense? It does, yeah, definitely. When we move away from that, or, or let me put it another way. If, if let me put it in a slightly mystical and poetic way if as okay. human beings okay. we're, if, if, uh, as, if as human beings we we're living at the realm of multiplicity then we are in some sense instruments of the whole okay everything that we do and say and think is going to be informed by the whole yeah now if um we move away from being instruments of the whole in that way. And our sense of self and sense of separation runs away with itself. Then we're operating at what we think is free will. We're doing what yes. we want to do. Yeah. So, so, so the notion of self has run away with itself and has lost sense of its connection with the whole. And we're no longer instruments of the whole. We're doing our own thing, which may be causing incoherence and fallacy. Ultimately, that's an illusion because whether we like it or not, we're plugged into the whole. That's it's correct. up to us whether we whether we operate in line with the whole. But in terms of the human experience, we, it would be a fragmentation in that experience, wouldn't it? 
Exactly, yes. Free will is a fragmentation because we are under the illusion that we can act as separate selves independent of the whole. And that's, that's exactly what fragmentation is. Wow. Yep. Well, that kind of hashes out everything to do with a diagram, doesn't it? Yeah. No? yeah. Um, well, let's, um, well, uh, the ground, with the ground yes, state. The ground. Let's, please explain what you first described as the ground state in your diamond model. So, you... so the, gra the ground state is what is the, the ultimate non-duality between the whole and the part, because the whole, the, the whole and multiplicity are not really separate from one another. We're talking of them as being two realms, but they're also, in, in a way, part of an even bigger whole, which is the um, existence. Oh. Is it? Is it? Is is the state of existence without exactly. human observation? Exactly. It's yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's everything. The, it, the the totality of that diamond, the whole, the the self, the the subject, the object, the parts, yeah. the totality of that diamond seen as a totality without any dualisms is the ground state. It's the diamond in its original pristine state of being. And that's non-dual. And because we haven't yet made dualisms and distinctions at that level, anything that we have to say at that level is going to come out as paradox. Wow, okay. Because we, we haven't yet made the necessary logical distinctions necessary yeah. to be able to talk coherently. We're, we're, we're neither coherent or incoherent at that point. So this is purely the realm of paradox, which is why mystics who are sort of in a state of enlightenment, who realize this non-duality in their own experience, often talk, Zen masters, they often talk in paradox because they're, they're coming from that ground state. Wow. Yeah. Well, that is a revelation, isn't it? This is phenomenal, this is so interesting. It's so interesting to see how your work has come to inform the way I ex go into explain relative consciousness. This really is phenomenal. Great. Um, I think we're having connection issues. Let me just, are we? Okay. Do you want to stop the recording briefly and then we can record again if we want to continue? No. Oh, it's fine now. It's fine now. It's fine. I just had a notification saying my net network okay. was so there we go. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we um if you give, give me give me one second. I just need to there's a just need to take a message on my telephone. No problem, that's fine. I'll yeah, come back. If you can just give me two minutes with that. Yes, message. no problem, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem at all. No problem at all. So is there is there more we need to
talk about and explore today? Or yeah, I, I, I would just like to good place to pause. I would just like your um, overall uh, insight. Or what, what do you think about this model and how it applies to what, how I'm using it? Do you think it has significance? Do you, do you feel that it works with everything that you've developed for the diamond model? Do, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it does. And I think it must do because I actually think the this diamond is so fundamental as a fractal. Think of it as a fractal. Yeah, yeah. You've got the whole, the part, the self, the object. As a fractal, I think it's so fundamental to our very way of experiencing the world because we're always experiencing wholes and parts. Yes. Yeah. Everything is a part of a whole and every, every hole is made up of parts, and every hole is a part of a big hole. So yes. we're always experiencing holes and parts. And obviously, we're always experiencing self and other, because the whole of experience is predicated on that distinction. So this whole fractal, uh, whole part, self, other, the diamond, I think it's so fundamental, potentially, that it should be able to find application anywhere. There shouldn't be a there shouldn't be a single field of human experience to which this diamond doesn't apply because in a way it's the very structure of our experiencing. Yes, yeah, I, I've come, I've come to see that. I'm coming to really yeah. see that, especially after our conversation today. Now, especially with um, those bits to add, and obviously, um, thank you. I just want to say thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Nish. Before we stop the oh, recording. Yeah. Um, this You're very welcome. It really wouldn't be possible without you, and um, I think it was determined for me to have met you, and I would just like that to be known. Adequ adequate determinism that we met. Adequate yeah. determinism, indeed, indeed. So, shall I stop the recording there, Nish? Yep. Let's stop that for today, and then, um, yeah, great. Oh, one second. How do I stop the call? Ah, oh, there it is.